here at the museum. And I am so excited to talk to you today about something really cool, and that's snake identification. And so um, this snake identification project is part of a citizen science project that has been going since Monday. Don't worry if you haven't joined in yet, you still have time. We will drop those links in the chat for you so you can participate in this project as well. But today we're going to find out some of those early results and learn more about the project in general. Okay, and so Carrie says start over, but not yet in the chat. <laughs> she says go, go, sorry. Okay. Sorry about that. Not sure what we missed there, but um, I just want to welcome you again. And um, we're dropping those links in the chat for the Citizen Science Project. Um, but before we get started, I do want to hear from you. And so today we are learning about snake identification. So in one of the um, venomous snakes that we can see, really the only venomous snakes that we can see here in the Raleigh area where the museum is located is the copperhead. So I want to know, do you know how to identify a copperhead? And if you do, let me know some of the signs that you look for to identify a copperhead from other snakes in the chat. And so today we are lucky to have Dr. Andrew Durso with us today. And he actually grew up here in Raleigh and has been involved with the museum and the North Carolina Herpetological Society in various capacities since the late 90s. He's a snake biologist and assistant professor at Florida Gulf Coast University in Fort Myers, Florida, and with a focus on population and community ecology of snakes. So um, he knows his snakes. So if you have any questions about snakes, put them in there too. Um, he was based in Jenna, Germany, and Geneva, Switzerland from 2016 to 2019, where he helped develop a crowdsourced and artificial intelligence approaches to snake identification with a goal of improving snake identification tools for doctors and patients in snake bite cases worldwide. So what we're learning today about North Carolina snake identification and the Citizen Science Project has actually been implemented worldwide to see what kind of identification um, knowledge people have all around the world. But today we're focusing on North Carolina. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Andrew. So take it away. Thank you so much, Miranda. It's such a great pleasure to be here. Um, as Miranda said, I grew up in Raleigh and I've spent a lot of time at the museum. Um, and I am going to be talking to you today about a citizen science project that I'm uh, running together with my colleagues at the University of Geneva and the University of Zurich in Switzerland, as well as the Museum of Natural Sciences and the North Carolina Herb Society. Um, the idea is that we want to try to measure how good or not people are at identifying snakes. And so you can take part in this um, today. Uh, it's been open since Monday and it'll be open through the end of next week, March 21st. You can see the URL there at the bottom, tinyurl.com slash NC snake ID consent. That'll take you to a, a consent form to fill out with a couple of questions um, that'll help us understand a little bit about who you are, nothing personally identifiable. And then at the end, there'll be a link to take the snake ID quiz. So the data I'm going to share with you today are actually ones that we collected over the last uh, three or four days during the online virtual reptile and amphibian day week. And I'll update these as more people participate in the challenge. So I really hope you go and check this out. You don't have to be a snake expert to participate. Um, we really want to know from everybody what they think these snakes are. And so that'll help us understand a little bit more about what they're commonly identified or misidentified as. And the reason we want to know this is that as a snake biologist, the most common kind of question that I get from people is, can you help me identify this snake? And sometimes I get really crazy photos like this one. Um, I'm not even sure 100% that there is a snake in this photo. And the person that took it was probably pretty scared, pretty nervous. Maybe they didn't want to get close to that snake. Um, but unfortunately, we probably won't be able to tell them what kind of snake it was. This is another favorite of mine that I got. Um, somebody asked me to help them identify this snake shed that they found. But of course, this isn't a snake shed at all. It's a piece of plastic from some kind of gardening um, bag of mulch or something like that. 
So these are kind of funny examples, but it's not entirely people's fault that they're sometimes pretty bad at identifying snakes. A lot of the resources that are available have major flaws. For instance, if you Google uh, image search for baby copperhead, what you're going to see is that five of the top 10 photos are actually not copperheads. They're decays brown snakes, which is a, a harmless, non-venomous slug and earthworm eating snake that's really common throughout North Carolina. And uh, your local news station probably isn't a much better source of information. Here's a, a screenshot from a news story. Copperheads are back, but they chose someone's pet ball python instead um, for the image. Uh, this isn't limited to, to the internet and television. Here are some pictures from uh, museums and nature centers where they've confused different snake species. In this case, two species that have similar names, a red-bellied water snake and a red-bellied snake. Uh, they both have red bellies, but they are definitely different species of snakes. Petco, Skilty, they've got this uh, brochure for taking care of your pet rough green snake. And although the snake pictured is both rough and green, it is a venomous Southeast Asian green tree viper, which I certainly hope is not for sale at your local Petco. Here's another uh, photograph from a museum display, not the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences. I don't actually know where it comes from. And this one shows you how you can tell your... Um, venomous rattlesnakes on top by their elliptical pupils and their heat sensing facial pits from your non-venomous round pupil no pit king cobra on the bottom. So they chose a, a picture of a even more venomous snake to represent their non-venomous snake. And um, this is all kind of a um, a little bit discouraging maybe as a herpetologist and also maybe a little bit funny for the average person, um, but it can lead to serious problems, right? For instance, uh, in medical guidance. So here's a pamphlet from the Red Cross. They've got pictures of the four most common groups of venomous snakes in North America. So you've got your coral snakes, your rattlesnakes, your cotton mouths, and then you take your cotton mouth and you turn that around so that it's facing the other direction and that's a copperhead. So they put a cotton mouth on there twice, no copperheads. Um, and this is potentially a cause for concern, right? Because venomous snake bite is a medical emergency. And even though it's not such a big deal in the United States, worldwide venomous snake bite is actually a public health crisis. Uh, the best numbers that we have suggest that something like 65 to 150,000 people die every year from venomous snake bite around the world. And maybe another three to 400,000 people are left with some kind of permanent uh, disability or disfigurement. Maybe they can't use a finger, a hand, lose a limb, something like that. And in the United States, you might not think about this very much. And that's because statistically speaking, the United States is pretty much the safest country in the world, both in terms of your likelihood of being bitten by a venomous snake and your likelihood of surviving if you have been bitten. That's not counting a couple of countries that don't have any venomous snakes like New Zealand, Iceland, Ireland, Madagascar. So it's a little bit more dangerous than those places, but it's safer than any other country that has venomous snakes, statistically speaking. And, and most developed countries in Europe uh, are sort of in the same group here. But there are places around the world where you're really likely to be bitten by a venomous snake. For instance, in Nepal, where many people uh, work outdoors without gloves, without um, shoes, without headlamps, probably likely to step on a venomous snake at some point in their lives. There's also places where if you're bitten, um, you don't have access to very good healthcare, places like Bangladesh, where there's not a lot of hospitals, where there's not a lot of roads to get to hospitals, and where the hospitals probably don't have anti-venom in stock necessarily, even if you get there. And then there are some places in the world, like indigenous communities in South America, where a high percentage of people in those communities end up being bitten by venomous snakes at some point in their life, and a high percentage of them, that also ends up being how they die. Um, so let me emphasize again, this is not the case in the United States, anywhere in the U.S., even North Carolina, which has one of the highest rates of snake bite of any U.S. state. Uh, the rate is absolutely very, very low compared to the fear that many people have of venomous snakes. I think the fear that people have of venomous snakes is way out of proportion to the risk they actually pose, given that you live in the United States or another developed country. So how my project connects to all this is that um, we started out by looking at the 
number of snake bite cases worldwide where the snake species involved was actually known or identified. And we found that that was the case in only a little over half of all snake bite cases worldwide. So almost 50% of the 30, almost 34,000 snake bite cases that we reviewed, the snake was never identified. And there were also a significant number of misidentifications. We found at least 100 misidentifications that led to some kind of inadequate victim management. Maybe the person got antivenom when they shouldn't have. Maybe they didn't get antivenom when they should have. Maybe they got the wrong kind of antivenom or different sort of supportive care. And in some cases, that even led to the death of the patient, although that was pretty rare. And so you might think, oh, that's pretty bad, but, you know, in the United States, things are probably better, right? And I was shocked to learn that that really isn't the case. So as recently as the period of time, 2001 to 2005, only 5% of snake bites in the U.S. were reported at the species level. And 30% of U.S. snake bites were from totally unknown snakes. So there were a lot of snake bites that were just uh, recorded as it was a rattlesnake, but no one bothered to figure out or write down the kind of rattlesnake. Now, maybe the person didn't see the snake that bit them or no one had an opportunity to do that. But I think we could definitely improve and we have improved. So more recently, 2013 to 2015, um, something more like 45% of snake bites in the U.S. were identified to the species level. But I think there's still a lot of room for improvement there. And, and so I hope, I think I've outlined a little bit for you the problem, which is that a lot of people, including doctors, are not particularly good at identifying snakes. It's not entirely their fault because the resources that they have available to them are um, complicated and difficult to use, perhaps, and they might contain mistakes. They certainly require uh, some specialized training. And in general, worldwide, the snake identification expertise is not really concentrated where the snake bite problem is. Most of the places where snake bite is really a big issue are developing countries in tropical parts of the world like sub-Saharan Africa, Southeast Asia, and Latin America, whereas the vast majority of snake experts are likely to live in countries like um, the United States and Canada, European countries, Australia, places like that. So as a result, even in those developed countries, we really don't know which snakes are biting people. And Without that information, of course, sometimes it would be possible to figure that out quickly enough to have some kind of clinical intervention. But even if you can't do that, it's really important to be able to relate a treatment outcome to the species of snake that bit the person because antivenoms are very specific to different species. But we don't have a lot of information about how well they work against species that they're not developed to work on. And there's a huge number of venomous snake species around the world that um, their venom is not used in the production of antivenoms. And the, the cross-reactivity of the different antivenom products seems to be pretty okay. But um, in some cases, it's probably not as good as others. And we need to be able to study that in order to figure out which of these antivenoms work well, which ones don't try to develop better ones. And this is even the case in the U.S. now because we now have um, three clinically approved antivenoms that are used to treat venomous snake bite in the U.S. We have the coral snake antivenom, and then we have two different antivenoms for pit viper bites, and they vary in how well they do at treating bites from different types of pit vipers, but nobody's really been able to do a proper study of it because we're missing a lot of information on which snake species are biting people. So we'd like to be able to relate those treatment outcomes to the different species of snakes. We can't do that unless we're doing a better job of identifying snake species in snake bite cases. Now, of course, there's other reasons you might want to identify snakes as well, right? You might see a snake in your yard or while you're out on a hike and you might be curious what species is it? Uh, is it venomous or not? Um, if it's, you know, regardless, uh, you might be interested in trying to figure out which species it is. And so there are a number of tools available to you to do that. Um, but my, my strongest recommendation, whether you like snakes or whether you have a fear of snakes or whether you feel sort of neutral towards snakes, is that you should try to learn to identify the species of snakes that are found in your area, because that's going to empower you with some knowledge to know which species are dangerous and which species are not, help you feel confident to um, understand which species are common in your area and which species are, are relatively rare. And one of the ways that you can get better at doing that is by participating in our North Carolina Snake ID Challenge. So this is the Citizen Science Project that I mentioned at the beginning. Um, the way it works is that you sign up through this URL, tinyurl.com slash consent. And you answer the survey, and then through March 21st, you can go to the link at the end and take the snake quiz. There's a thousand pictures of snakes representing all 38 
species of snakes native to North Carolina, as well as all 100 North Carolina counties. Now, you don't have to do all 1,000 of those images. You can just do a couple if you want to, but you can, you can play as long as you want, basically. Um, the information is useful to us either way, and it should be fun and, and educational for you either way. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to have this open through March 21st, and then we'll um, stop collecting data and begin uh, analyzing the data more rigorously. And we're going to give some prizes, uh, some field guides to amphibians and reptiles in the Carolinas to people that do particularly well. So if you've already participated or if we've used one of your photos in this ID challenge, thank you very much. And if you haven't participated yet, I would strongly encourage you to sign up and do so. Um, I'll have a little bit more detail on exactly how to do that at the end. There's a video. Um, from Monday that you can watch. But what I'm going to do for the rest of the seminar is give you kind of a sneak preview into what IDs people have submitted so far. So I'm not going to give a ton of detail because I don't want to bias your responses too much, but I will give you some sense of which species to maybe look out for that are commonly confused, give you some sense of which species are most um, accurately ID'd and which are least accurately ID'd. Okay, so as of this morning, about 150 people have already participated. And as I said, if one of those is you, thank you very much. Um, in total, those people have provided about 20,000 snake IDs. So the total sample size for what I'm showing you today is about 20,000 independent snake IDs. Like I said, you don't have to do all of the photos. You can ID as few or as many photos as you like. You also don't have to be an expert to participate. So it's totally fine if you get them wrong. In fact, um, I'm not going to say that we want you to get them wrong, but we are definitely very interested in what people select when they don't get the answer right, because we want to understand which snake species are most commonly confused or which other snake species. We want to do that in a really quantitative and rigorous way. So, so far, overall, almost 84% of those 20,000 IDs are correct, which is really good and I think probably reflects the fact that mostly people who like snakes and already know a fairly good amount about snakes are participating and that's great we definitely want those people to participate but we actually want to know about incorrect IDs too so I would encourage you to encourage your maybe non-snake friends or people that maybe feel neutrally about snakes to also participate because we really would like to sample sort of a wide variety of different expertise levels and experience levels with this challenge. Okay, so um, let me just show you a little bit of information about who's participated so far. You'll see these are some of the questions that you'll be asked to answer on that first form. Um, so, so far about half of the people who have participated currently live in North Carolina. Another 10% or so have lived in North Carolina in the past and about 40% have never lived in North Carolina, although they might live in an adjacent state. And on average, the people that do live in North Carolina have lived here for about 20 years, although of course there's a whole span from one year up to maybe 70 years or something like that. Okay. In addition, we ask people to tell us, okay, how much experience do you have identifying snakes from North Carolina? So about two thirds of the participants so far think that they have more experience than most of the people that they know. Um, about a quarter think they have about the same amount of experience as most people they know, and then a small fraction think they have less. So I would like to actually have more representation from a group of people that think they have less experience identifying snakes than most people they know. And we also asked how much uh, experience do you have, and the average that people reported is about nine years of experience identifying species of snakes from North Carolina. But you'll see that 84% overall accuracy is really impressive given that 87% um, of the people have participated so far are not working as professional herpetologists. And almost half of those people have never kept reptiles in captivity and don't identify as a field herper. So somebody who goes looking for amphibians and reptiles in the field. So that's that's pretty impressive considering that such a high fraction of those people don't really feel like they know that much maybe about snakes or if they do, they don't actively participate in snake related activities. Now what I'll do at the, um, when the challenge is closed is I'll go through and try and figure out a little bit more specifically, how do these things, how well do these things predict people's performance? I don't have that data to show you today because that's something we'll do all at once at the end. Um, but this just gives you sort of a general sense of who's participated so far. 
Okie dokie. So let's look at the 38 snake species of North Carolina. I know the names are a little bit small there, but I'll I'll pull out and point out some of the really significant ones. So here they are ranked in order of um, the average accuracy from highest to lowest. And you'll see that the species that's identified the most accurately overall is one of our most iconic and recognizable species. That's our rough green snake. These are our only bright green snakes. Um, we don't have the other species of green snake, the smooth green snake from uh, sort of the northeastern and midwestern U.S., it's not present in North Carolina, although it gets pretty close in the Appalachians of uh, Virginia. So there's not a lot of close lookalikes to confuse this species with. And so far, over 98% of the 442 IDs have been correct for rough green snake. And you can see on the top panel there, the species that rough green snakes are occasionally misidentified as. So sometimes maybe for garter snakes, some people also call these green garden snakes. So that could be a little bit just confusion of which name applies to which species. Same thing, I think, for rough earth snake. You might start typing rough green snake and end up submitting rough earth snake as an answer. So a couple of these misidentifications could even be typos. And then on the bottom panel, you'll see which species are commonly misidentified as rough green snakes. So sort of the, the false positives. You'll see that overall, less than 1% of other snakes are misidentified as rough green snakes. It's 0.06%. But it's some of the same species, some of the small earth snakes, um, queen snake, rat snake. A very small number overall. Okay, so that gives you kind of your high bar. Let's look at some species that are a little bit more likely to be misidentified, uh, including the one mentioned in the title of this talk. So here are two of our more common venomous snake species throughout the state, the copperhead, which is found statewide, and the cottonmouth, which is found in the coastal plain. Um, I was actually really surprised to see that copperheads were the second most accurately identified species challenge-wide so far. So most people can correctly identify copperheads. Only 3% of those IDs are incorrect. Cottonmouths, a little bit worse. They're tougher, maybe 12% incorrect, but still overall objectively pretty good. Um, out of almost 1,000 IDs, there were only eight copperheads that were misidentified as something else. You can see mostly as cottonmouths, corn snakes, a couple as hognose snakes or timber rattlesnakes. There are also a very low number of false positives, although a lot more than for the rough green snake. So I, I do think to some extent, folks have a tendency to say that maybe everything's a copperhead. And so they're more likely to misidentify something like a hognose snake or a brown water snake as a copperhead. But I was really surprised to see how how accurate this uh, species was in terms of identification and also how few false positives there were. Now, remember I said cottonmouths were a little bit tougher, right? So out of about 450 IDs, about 30 of those were not correct. So only 88% IDs correct. Lots of confusion with the copperhead as well as with different water snake species, um, coupled with corn snakes or hognose snakes. And um, on the bottom, you can see, again, the false positives. So a number of different water snake species were incorrectly identified as copperheads. That's uh, as cottonmouths, excuse me, that's even higher. So about 54 um, false positives for cottonmouth. And those water snake species I'm actually going to highlight next because they're really difficult. We've got four different species of water snakes in North Carolina. And even the most accurately identified one, the northern water snake, still incorrectly ID'd about 15% of the time. Um, the banded water snake, which is kind of the coastal plain counterpart of the northern water snake, is actually the most incorrectly identified snake in the whole state so far. So only 43% of those um, IDs are incorrect, meaning 57% are, are correct. So here you can see all of the different things that banded water snakes are confused with, mostly with other water snake species, quite a bit with cotton mouths, and then also with uh, some other species less frequently. And there's also a pretty high false positive rate, 1.4%, which is hundreds of times higher than some of the other species. I know 1.4% doesn't sound very high, but compared to something like the rough green snake, it's, it's um, two or three orders of magnitude higher. 
And you can see there's a lot of confusion again with northern water snakes, right? A lot of people see a northern water snake, they think maybe it's a banded water snake. And that's actually pretty understandable because these two species look really similar. And in fact, North Carolina is the part of their range where uh, the hybrid zone between banded and northern water snakes is the most well characterized. So these are relatively closely related species. They actually do form hybrids kind of along a little area, a little bit south of the fall zone. So in the areas of this map that are sort of checkered. Um, so the northern water snake is found in most of the Piedmont, certainly all throughout the mountains. Banded water snake is found throughout most of the coastal plain, but then the northern water snake kind of sneaks around through northeastern North Carolina and makes it down through all of the outer banks. So there's not... Um, there's, there's a lot of opportunity for contact between these two species, and they do actually interbreed in several different places. And so you can see all of the different variants that it's possible to have throughout North Carolina. Some are very red, some are very gray, some are very brown, some are more yellow. The bands may be very bright and visible, especially on young individuals, or they may be extremely difficult to make out, particularly on water snakes that live in... Um, water bodies that have lots of tannins from decaying oak leaves in them that turns water snakes and other species of animals that live in those places kind of a dark brown or black. So it makes it pretty difficult to identify them. Um, a good way to tell these species apart is of course, one is where they're found, right? But then if you're in one of those um, zones of contact then that's not nearly as helpful. And the other thing is to look at how connected the bands are on their body. So on the northern water snake on the top left, you can see that those bands are kind of staggered or offset from each other as you move towards the tail. Whereas on banded water snakes, the bands are complete all the way down the body. And that's a pretty good characteristic to look at most of the time. Okay, let's look at a couple of other pairs of commonly confused species. So actually the, the most commonly confused pair of species in the whole state so far are the two species of hognose snakes. We have the more widespread eastern hognose snake, which was incorrectly identified as the rare and uh, endangered southern hognose snake 11% of the time. It's even worse in the other direction. Southern hognoses are being confused for easterns 28% of the time. Um, and that's really unfortunate because southern hognose snakes are one of our coolest and most interesting species of snakes in the entire state. North Carolina probably has the best populations of southern hognose snakes remaining in the entire world because they've declined hugely throughout most of their range. And I think it would be good if there was more awareness of these of this species throughout the state. Uh, the Herb Society has a long-running project called Project Simus, which is the part of the scientific name of the southern hognose snake, to monitor them and understand more about their biology. So I was a little bit surprised to see them on here, but the two species do look relatively similar. Similar. Um, it's a little bit easier for certain eastern hognose snakes that have more dark patterns. When they're young, like these two individuals, it is easy to confuse them. Eastern hognose has more of a flat snout with a larger eye. Southern hognose has a little bit smaller eyes and a more sharply upturned snout. And the pattern is also a little bit neater on the southern hognose. Okay, another really understandable pair of commonly confused species are our two species of earth snakes, the rough earth snake and the smooth earth snake. These are both small brown snakes that don't have a lot of pattern. You really have to look closely at their scales in order to differentiate them. The rough earth snake has keeled scales, which means that each of the scales has a small ridge running down the center, kind of like the keel of a boat whereas smooth earth snakes have smooth, glossy scales that don't have any ridges. Uh, rough earth snakes also tend to have a little bit more of a collar around their neck, especially when they're young. But when they get older, like this individual, that collar pretty much disappears. So they can be fairly variable in how dark or light brown they are. Definitely difficult to tell them apart. And you can see people confuse them for each other about 12% of the time in both cases. Another deceptively similar pair of species are corn snakes and mole king snakes. These are two relatively large, relatively seldom seen constricting snakes that eat mostly mammals as adults. Um, they both kind of have a, a tan to brown to sort of orange red ground color with a series of blotches. Now, the belly looks very different. Corn snakes have a black and white checkered belly, whereas mole king snakes have more of a tan belly. 
Another difference is that corn snakes always have sort of a spear point shape between their eyes, whereas mole king snakes don't have that. And there are also some small differences in the scalation. So if you count the scales or look at certain scales, you can tell them apart that way. Um, but it is kind of difficult, especially if you have a very brightly colored juvenile mole king snake or a very dull colored corn snake. Um, it can be a bit tough to, to tell these apart. And these are also sort of sometimes confused with eastern milk snakes in the mountains, which have sort of a similar pattern as well. Speaking of milk snakes, the final pair of species that I want to highlight are two of our um, brightly colored coral snake mimics, the scarlet king snake and the scarlet snake. So neither of these two species is a coral snake. These are both species that mimic coral snakes, and they also closely resemble each other. And so not terribly surprisingly, people tend to mix them up a little bit. Scarlet snakes being confused as scarlet king snakes 14% of the time and the other way around 16% of the time. And they do look pretty similar. The biggest difference and the easiest way to tell these two species apart is that scarlet king snakes have a white belly and on scar uh, sorry, scarlet snakes have a white belly and on scarlet king snakes the bands go all the way around their body now, obviously in a picture you can't pick them up and identify and examine the belly but you can kind of see by looking at the side of the scarlet snake that those bands don't circle the body completely um, you might be asking okay how frequently are these two misidentified as coral snakes and they really aren't confused with coral snakes very often compared to how often they're confused with each other so only about 1% of the time in the case of the scarlet snake, about 1.5% of the time in the case of the scarlet king snake. So people doing this challenge so far are pretty darn good at identifying snakes of North Carolina. And I, I challenge you, if you think you're really good at IDing snakes of North Carolina, to jump in here and try and make these numbers look even better. If you don't think you're good at identifying snakes of North Carolina, that's okay too. We really do want to know what species you think these are because we want to understand what people confuse different species for. Um, that'll be really helpful in the future. Now, you might be thinking, okay, this is maybe interesting if you like snakes, but it may not be particularly important because most of these commonly confused species, and it's not like we're commonly confusing harmless snakes with dangerous snakes for the most part. Probably most um, between cottonmouths and different species of non-venomous water snakes. But worldwide, there are some non-venomous snakes that very closely mimic some very dangerous species of snakes. In the Americas, we have our coral snakes and their mimics, and that gets a lot more complicated and difficult to uh, keep straight the further south you go throughout Latin America. Uh, in Asia, they have uh, their crates, which are very difficult to tell apart from wolf snakes, which closely mimic them. So here's a white-banded wolf snake, a juvenile Malayan crate that look extremely similar. Wolf snakes are harmless. Crates are extremely dangerous. There are also groups of venomous snakes that are very challenging to tell apart from each other, but may require different antivenoms. So in many places in sub-Saharan Africa, you have puff adders on the right, as well as different species of saw-scaled vipers on the left. These two groups of snakes need different antivenoms because their venoms are biochemically very different from each other. But they look really similar, and particularly when puff adders are young, it's very difficult for even experts sometimes to tell them apart. So... This type of work, even though we're focusing today on North Carolina snakes, this is really transferable to other parts of the world. And you'll see when you take the survey that at the end, we ask you whether or not you have experience identifying snake species from any other parts of the world. And if so, if you'd be willing to spend a little bit of time um, offering up that experience to help doctors and epidemiologists, maybe even patients in snake bite cases, identifying snakes um, to help improve treatment outcomes and epidemiological data. Our long-term goal here is that we want to make sort of an app that people can use, uh, both to help others identify snakes and to get snakes identified. And if you've used the Merlin bird ID app before, the idea is to make something a little bit like this, where it's really easy to follow a couple simple questions, and you'll get an answer that's really tailored to the location where you are. Um, there's no substitute for learning the snakes yourselves, and I really do encourage you to try to do that. And... Um, but I think it's something that could be really helpful in the future. So with that, I just want to encourage you one more time, please take part in the North Carolina Snake Citizen Science Challenge. Tell your friends, especially your friends who you think might not find out about it otherwise. Uh, it's tinyurl.com slash ncsnakeidconsent. 
open through March 21st. And if you run into help, uh, if you run into problems and you need help, there is a video posted on the museum's uh, Citizen Science Adventures series that you can watch. You can reach out to me or you can reach out to um, the Prairie Ridge Eco Station Facebook page. That's a really good place to get support for different citizen science issues. So that's everything I wanted to share. I am super happy to take your questions and uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Andrew. And um, I have to say, I noted in the chat that I have been having so much fun um, participating and I do wish that I would have watched this presentation before I <laughs> jumped into the identifications because I have learned a few tips on some of those tricky ones. Um, speaking of those tricky ones, the ones um, you were sharing a couple slides ago, mm -hmm. um, we did have a question um, about if those pairs overlapped in range. Yeah, good question. So a lot of them do. Um, Southern hognose snakes are really only found in the sand hills and the southern coastal plain, whereas eastern hognose snakes are found pretty much statewide. Was that about the North Carolina species or the, the other? I think, yes, the North Carolina species. This okay. species right here. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, yeah, the other three, so scarlet snakes and scarlet king snakes are also pretty much both coastal plain. Um, earth, earth snakes, both species are found throughout the state and more or less the same as the case for corn snakes and mole king snakes. I, I'm not sure how far into the coastal plain mole king snakes are found, but there's pretty wide overlap in the ranges of all four of these species pairs. And the same is true for these actually, right? So both the crate and the wolf snake are found in India, both the puff adder and the saw scaled viper are found throughout sub-Saharan Africa. And I do not have a lot of experience IDing um, snakes worldwide, but um, that wolf snake and crate are some of the cutest snakes I've ever seen, so. <laughs> yeah, they are cute, but I, I urge you to resist the temptation to pick them up. <laughs> Will do. Sure. Um, I like to observe snakes, but I don't um, know the identification of at a distance. That's probably but, wise. Um, yes. I, I encourage others to do that as well. If you don't know what it is, just um, look at it. Take a picture from far away yep. um, out of striking distance. Cool. And so, um, so yeah, I don't see any more questions. I do have a okay. tip because I did have some issues when I was trying to sign up for the project. You have to create an account on the website. And for whatever reason, like I was having trouble um, getting it to show up in my Gmail. I have heard that um, even though we have those three tabs on Gmail now, that some of the emails are being sent to the spam folder. So check your spam folder if you are having trouble getting um, that login email. So um and yeah, please sign up for it. Um, I'm thinking of like having my mom do it, but I, you know, I, she's one of those people that like, I don't see garden snake on here. Like, <laughs> yeah, like yeah. Is, so. we, we do support some uh, other common names, right? So like if you type in water moccasin, for instance, that'll come up. Um, I can't remember if garden snake is in there. Um, certainly if you don't know exactly what it's called, you might end up saying that it's one thing and really meaning that it's something else. And, and that's actually okay, right? I mean, people confuse species with each other for different reasons. And one reason might be, well, the name's not very clear, right? So I think that's fine. And I did notice on there, um, if you have, really have no idea where to even start, um, there is a skip option. So you can just skip over that Absolutely. photograph. Absolutely, yep, that's true. So you won't get completely stuck on there if you, so if you feel like coming in with zero knowledge at all, you can still participate, even if it's just, you know, the ones that you think, you know, whether it's a worm snake or a copperhead and identifying those. Yeah. Don't be ashamed to, to skip them. And, and I'll just show you here what it looks like. Can y'all see this? Uh, so here's the challenge itself. So you can see what snake is this. Here's the location, the person who took the photo. You can skip it if you don't know, or you can type in. So like, I know this is a brown snake, so I'll type brown. You can see I get three different ones, brown water snake, decays brown snake, or brown king snake. So it's a decays brown snake. Okay, yes, that is correct. So that's how it works. And at the beginning, you were talking about, um, you know, anti-venom and um, venomous snakes and identification. Mm -hmm. And um, Katrina had a question from then. Um, why would someone who was bitten by a venomous snake be specifically supposed to not get anti-venom? Well, I think the issue is that, well, okay, there's kind of two different answers, I guess. One reason is that if you're not sure what kind of snake bit you, then the safest thing to do is to... Um, wait and see if you develop any symptoms so that it's clear whether or not you need antivenom because 
being given antivenom if you don't need any is also pretty dangerous. The antivenom itself causes physiological responses that need to be managed in a, in a hospital setting. Uh, it's also really expensive and there's a limited supply. So we don't want to be wasting it on people who don't actually need it. And so currently the sort of syndromic approach to snake identification is used in many places, right? A person comes in, a snake bit me. No, I don't know what kind. We'll just wait and we'll see what symptoms you have and we'll try and figure it out that way. That can work but obviously you lose some time doing that. It's definitely better to administer that antivenom earlier if you can. Um, so I think that uh, hopefully that at least partly answers the question. I think so. Um, okay. Katrina, if, if it doesn't, um, you can clarify in the chat. Yeah, um, so we have a Boston Terrier in the chat and they want to know if you have no idea um, what the snake is, but want to know what it is, will putting in a random guess be a problem for the data? Hmm, a random guess. Yeah, that is a good question. What is the guidance on that? I would say it's, as long as you're not doing it a lot, I'm assuming that not a lot of people are going to do that. So it probably won't cause a serious problem. Um, probably should have thought of a, really solid guideline on that to begin with. <laughs> but I, I, I think it's okay. You know, try to make the best guess that you can, right? If you're, if you're sure it's not something, don't put that, right? Put something that at least you think it could conceivably be. And actually, another thing that I'll mention is that you can put in a higher taxonomic category also. So like here, uh, let's see what comes up here. So I don't know what species of snake this is, but I'm pretty sure it's not a venomous snake. So it's not a, a viper or what we call an elapid. That's the family for coral snakes. So you can also type the family Colubridae, which is all of the non-venomous snakes, and you can send that in. It says, okay, this is a coach whip. And that's correct. You know, it is in that family. So you can do that, although you have to know this special word. So a little bit hidden. Um, I'll have to think about developing a better way to implement that in the future. Yeah, that's a great tip. And I, um, because there really are those, just the, the three higher level groups. And so that's a, a good. Exactly. Good so it's guess. vipers, elapids, and colubrids. And we only have one elapid. Right. That's right. That's the coral <laughs> snake. Yep. And five vipers. And then the other um, 30 plus species are all colubrids. All right. Um, can I um, ask you, this is a personal tip question. Okay. I'm having trouble with like queen snakes and versus like glossy crayfish versus mm -hmm. red belly water snakes. What are some tips there, especially like the glossy crayfish and the and the queen snake, I was having trouble with those. Even like when I was like trying to do like research, like, okay, how do I tell the difference between these? Sure. And it is confusing. They used to be in the same genus and they are still pretty closely related. Um, so one good way is the range, right? Queen snakes are mostly found in the mountains and the upper Piedmont. Glossy crayfish snakes are mostly found in the coastal plain. Um, Another way is similar to the rough and smooth earth snake. So they look similar at first, but queen snakes actually have keeled scales like a water snake and glossy crayfish snakes have smooth scales. Um, they do superficially resemble each other though. I mean, they basically have the same colors, yellow on the belly. If you could pick them up, you could see that the glossy crayfish snake has a brighter belly pattern. And that is, I think, visible in some of the images, but that's probably the main guidance I would, I would give you. Um, as far as telling a queen snake from a red-bellied water snake, um, it can be really difficult to judge the size in a photo, right? They're, they're pretty different sizes. A small red-bellied water snake is probably going to have a really bold pattern, whereas a queen snake is, doesn't really have a strong pattern at any age. So if you see a really plain red-bellied water snake, it's probably going to be too big to be a queen snake. But of course, that is difficult to, to judge in the photo. Another thing I guess you could look at would be the striping on the lips. So queen snakes don't really have very stripy lips compared to water snakes. Okay, those are super helpful tips. And I feel justified in the question because um, Chris Goforth also is having issues with this. Definitely, <laughs> definitely. No, there, there are no stupid questions. I mean, even experts make mistakes all the time, right? We just don't like to admit it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and in our worldwide snake ID challenge that we did um, a couple of years ago, you know, even the even the best people are getting maybe 90% of the IDs correct, right? Nobody's getting 100% correct. Yeah, and some of these um, photographs are difficult, um, 
you know, to see the entire snake or see a part of the snake that, you know, would help you identify it as well. So it kind of adds to the challenge and a little bit to the fun, right. To um, those those kind of tiny pinpoints that, um, you know, there are resources online where you can kind of send a picture and there are kind of experts hanging around waiting to answer (laughs) your question. Mm -hmm. What kind of snake is this? Right. And they can see like a tail slithering underneath the house and be like, Oh, that's this problem. Right. Where I'm like, what? I didn't even see the snake in the photo. (laughs) So, um, Oh yeah. Um, okay, here's a good question for you, and you probably have uh, strong feelings about this. Um, <laughs> what can I say to people that tell me the only snake is a the only good snake is a dead snake? The only good snake is a dead snake. Yeah, a lot of people like to say that. Um, so I recently gave a presentation about this called "The Only Good Snake Is an Identified Snake," <laughs> and and you know I do encourage people to try and learn that snake species because I think once they do that they tend to not feel that way as much anymore because a little bit of knowledge is very empowering. Um, I also tend to tell people that, you know, snakes don't really want anything to do with you, right? They're much happier to be left alone. And a pretty good fraction, 20 or 30% of all of the snake bites in the United States are, are caused by what we call intentional interactions with the snake. So the person has decided that they're going to pick up the snake for whatever reason, maybe to try to kill it, maybe to try and relocate it. Maybe they're showing off to their friends. So we could cut venomous snake bite down actually by a lot by choosing not to interact with those snakes. Really, they they just want to get away from you and hide. And of course, they also play beneficial roles in ecosystems. They're predators that help maybe control populations of some prey species that are pests like mice and rats. Um, But it is very difficult to change attitudes about snakes. Some people are really afraid of snakes. It's one of the most common phobias. I think it's very culturally ingrained in people, that attitude that, that any snake that I find needs to be killed. So... You know, it's it's unfortunate, but I think through the sort of crowdsourced education um, that we can do now through social media, I would encourage somebody who says that to also become a member of um, like one of the Facebook snake identification groups. Those are really good forums to learn how to identify your local snakes. And you can just kind of lurk on there and kind of like constantly playing the snake ID challenge in the background. You don't even have to put in your guess. You just have to check the comments to see if you're right. And a lot of people post testimonials in those groups all the time. that like, this group changed my life. I used to hate snakes and kill all the snakes that I see. And now I love them. So maybe suggest getting involved in a in an online community like that could be another way. Yeah, that's definitely, I mean, we've seen the power of um, just knowledge and learning and interacting in a safe way with Mm -hmm. snakes um, can change people. We had someone um, who was a visitor to Reptile Amphibian Day, you know, came to the museum often, but, um, you know, one year, like went to a table and talked to someone for a long time about a live snake. They had a live snake She had a snake phobia her entire life, did not like snakes. And um, several years later, I mean, just could not stop talking about positive things about snakes. And so knowledge is power and being, yeah, and just learning more and um, interacting with them in a safe way, whether it's on social media or, um, you know, coming and talking to people who have a passion about snakes, I think Mm -hmm. can really make a huge difference. And even if it's someone that you know of, you know, tell them a cool natural history story about a snake that you can learn or something like that might make a a big difference. Um, I have copperheads in my yard every single summer and, um, you know, they do not, when they see me, they might freeze because they're afraid I might do something to them. But as soon as I step out of their sight, they are gone within seconds. And, um, yep. You know, I've seen, been able to see them eating cicadas that have emerged from my yard. And it's just oh, cool. really fascinating to be able to see um, really cool behaviors like that. So um, that is cool. Yeah. Yeah. And another good natural history tidbit, particularly for all of our native uh, vipers, is that they're actually some of the best parents of any snakes. So all the rattlesnake species, copperheads, even cottonmouths will stay with their um, newborn babies. They give birth to live young and they'll stay with them for several days after they're born, which is not something that we normally associate with reptiles. I think that a little bit like parental care, motherhood can be an avenue to convince people that like, these are animals just like us and they do all of the same things basically that we or any other animal do. Yeah. That's amazing. I love that. All right. And, um, (laughs) so Chris had another question. Um, she wants to know, can we see how well we're doing overall? And so is there any way that 
um, I could get my results, say I um, identify all 1,000 photos. Is there a way that I can see my results, how I did? So in the past, we had kind of a leaderboard on the, on the global one. And I really liked that. And I was hoping to have it again for this challenge. And unfortunately, we don't have the public leaderboard this time around. But that's a feature that we want to bring back in future iterations. Um, if you want to talk to me one-on-one -on -one about it, we might be able to figure something mm -hmm. out. I, I do need to respect the uh, privacy um, rules about human subjects research, but reach out and let me know and, and maybe there might be a way. I would be interested just to know maybe um, which snakes I'm confusing. I need to learn more. <laughs> sure, about, sure. Maybe. And hopefully, by, but hopefully, you know, there's a thousand photos. Hopefully those last 200, I am just nailing when I get to them. I hope but, so too. Yeah. <laughs> I'm definitely learning a lot. I think I'm just over a hundred and I've learned so much already. Nice. Um, so, so much fun. Um, Good. And um, Katrina is excited, said those groups sound cool that you mentioned. Um, she loves snakes and herps in general, but is not too great at identification. I think just exposure to it is going to help you with that. So anyone who's interested, sure. yeah, join those groups. And even if you're not saying anything, just figure out how they're identifying them and um, look for those kind of tips. And um, yeah, they have really good curated collections of resources. But honestly, I think as you said, it's just about exposure, right? It's like learning to do anything. You can't learn to play the piano or speak French overnight. You have to practice at it. And that's the same way, whether you want to learn to identify snakes, birds, trees, you know, anything is going to require some time and some repeated exposure. Right, exactly. Um, which, you know, working on a thousand photo um, <laughs> can be lots of exposure to yeah, help out with that. Definitely. <laughs> Yeah, and um, and um, Nancy also dropped in some links for some ID help if you want to maybe do a little bit of background research just to get those names in your head at least and um, help sure. you narrow down those species. Um, all right, and we are just about out of time, Andrew. I want to thank you so much again for um, setting up this project um, for everyone to participate in, first of all, and um, you know, telling us about how it's going. I am excited to see the results. Um, me too. When you come out with them. <laughs> so hopefully we get some more um, kind of, I guess, non-snake um, fans out there or super fans, I guess. I can see that at least 20 people have signed up since the start of this talk. So I think Fantastic. that's, that's yeah. pretty good. <laughs> good job, guys. Yeah. And so, yeah, get those IDs in. Um, please, please do. All right. Awesome. And yeah, so thank you all so much for coming to this presentation. Um, tell other people um, about this project and have them participate. Um, it's really exciting. I might see if I can get my husband to, <laughs> to mm -hmm. check it out too. Um, see how he does with it. Um, I mean, it was fun just talking to my coworkers about um, how they're doing on it. Oh yeah. Yeah. People get very competitive. I mean, the, the other one, a uh, couple of people wrote me to say things like, well, you know, I'm like, I'm doing this at work when I'm supposed to be doing other things. I was supposed to get a lot of work done today, but all I did is I do snakes. One person said they weren't sleeping. I was like, wow, I'm not sure I can condone that. But like, thank you for spending your time. <laughs> yeah, we were definitely um, like, while we were prepping for this one, we just kept doing it until we we're like, okay, we have to focus, right? <laughs> sure, sure. But don't neglect your basic needs, but do participate. Right. Yes, yes. <laughs> Um, all right. Well, thank you again for coming. Thank you so much, Andrew. Um, I'm excited to get dive in more and learn more, um, practice my snake identification. Um, thank you all again for coming. We do have more programs coming up. We have one that starts in just a few minutes about diamondback rattlesnake research on Jekyll Island in Georgia. Um, so you can check it out on the YouTube site or um, go on to naturalsciences.org, click on Reptile and Amphibian Day, and then look at those programs upcoming today and tomorrow. We have our last day of Reptile and Amphibian Day. It's lots of fun stuff for all ages, so make sure you check those out. Um, if you are a museum member, thank you so much. Um, and if not, then that's okay. You can still become one. Um, we are always so thankful for our museum members. You help make programs like this happen. And um, if you join now during Reptile and Amphibian Days, then you actually get a free Reptile and Amphibian Days t-shirt featuring the marbled salamander, which is um, super cute. And I can't wait to get mine. Um, thank you again for coming. Naturalsciences.org to check out more upcoming programs. Thanks again. We'll see you later. Bye.
um, super cute. And I can't wait to get mine. Um, thank you again for coming. Naturalsciences.org to check out more upcoming programs. Thanks again. We'll see you later. Bye.